I'm afraid this hat is here to stay for the time being. I don't like it any more than you do, but I still can't find the blue one that I had been wearing. Um, in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about exceptions to sound change rules. In previous videos on historical linguistics, I have sometimes um, I've sometimes cited something called the neo-grammarian principle or the neo-grammarian uh, neo rule, and this is the idea that when a sound change happens in a given dialect of a given language, the sound change will apply across the board uh, in any situation where its criteria are met. So to take an example, let's say that there was a sound change in my sort of dialect of English where p became f, um, and that was the rule. The neogrammarian principle states that all instances of p in my entire dialect should become f, uh, because the sound change applies across the board. Um, the neogrammarian principle acknowledges a very obvious feature of sound change, which is that it, it's very often environmentally restricted, environmentally constrained. Um, so an example of that might be, let's say in my dialect, you had this sound change of p being lenited to f, but it only happened when the p was directly in between two vowels inside of a word. So in that instance, the word pepper would become pepper because the p at the start would remain the same because it's not between two vowels in the middle of a word. It's right at the start of a word. But the one in the middle uh, would uh, become f because it's in between two vowels in the middle of a word, so pepper. And that would also affect the word upper, which would become uffer because it, it meets the same criteria. So the idea would be that if the neogrammarian principle is true, all instances of p in that environment, in that dialect, would become f with no exceptions. This is a useful um, rule of thumb and it describes the probabilistic patterns that we see when languages undergo sound change, say 90% of the time if a sound is in the right environment, in the right dialect, it will change, maybe even more than 90% of the time. But it clearly doesn't account for everything. You know, if you take all of the words in my own dialect of English that are directly descended from Old English words, applying the expected sound changes to all of the Old English words in the list does not necessarily give you all of the exactly correct um, words in my own accent. Uh, so clearly there are cases where exceptions do occur. This doesn't destroy the validity of um, historical linguistics. This doesn't, you know, this doesn't make it impossible to make any hypotheses about what languages were like in the past, pronunciation-wise. Um, the, the patterns are still extremely strong and extremely reliable. Um, but it is interesting that, that there are these exceptions. And it's good to ask, why are there these exceptions? Why do they happen? Can they perhaps be predicted? Um, language is a system employed by humans, and so there's naturally just a lot of noise because human behaviour just interferes. I suppose it makes it impossible for it to be as simple as we might like it to be. So one reason that a dialect might contain a word which seems to evade or have the wrong sound changes is because of cross-dialectal borrowing. We all know that languages can loan words to each other, um, like, I don't know, the English word schadenfreude being loaned from German schadenfreude, um, or further back in time, various English words being loaned from um, being learned borrowings from Latin, or um, loan words from French, the whole pig, pork thing. Loaning can occur between dialects of one language, um, and, and why not? Because dialects, you know, two dialects of English are just mini languages that are very closely related to each other. So there's no reason why loaning shouldn't happen on this smaller scale as well. So one example of a, a, an interesting case, which I think there's, there's a strong case to be made that it is uh, interdialectal borrowing, is the case of the word oaf. Now, in my dialect of English, there's the word elf, 
which means a, a little green man that hops around the forest. Uh, but there's also the word oaf, which is not not very commonly used nowadays, but it means, I think it means a kind of stupid or unaware person, you know, not very aware of their surroundings. Um, maybe there are slightly different meanings. That I, I hear it so little that I'm not 100% sure what, what it's supposed to mean, but that a stupid person, a silly person is... is um, is, is the impression I get. So I, growing up, didn't assume that these words were really related at all. But then when I was going through a 19th century uh, Cumbrian dialect dictionary, I found a hypothesis that suggested that they may in fact be cognates with each other. They might come from the same ancestral word. And the idea was in... Um, northern Middle English, uh, there were certain words which contained a sequence of a, the vowel in words like cat and trap, followed by uh, a velarized l sound. So um, like the, the, the sound that I use in the word tall, there was a sound change where these owl sequences uh, became diphthongs rather than being a sequence of a vowel a followed by a consonant l. The consonant l started to vocalize. There was no longer any closure where the tongue touched the alveolar ridge above the gum line, so it just became basically a vowel u u instead of o o. So this al sequence became al. Now, given the words that were originally um, Owl words in Northern Middle English, uh, you had words like talc, walk, half, al, calf, and alf becoming uh, talc, walk, half, al, calf, and alf. And then over time, different, uh, different dialects took this diphthong in different directions. Um, and in many Northern English dialects, and also in Scots, it became uh, a long monophthong with lip rounding, something like or, I'm thinking in terms of the Cumbrian dialect uh, that, that the dictionary I was reading relates to. So talk, walk, cough, hoff, or, and off. And the word off, as it existed in Northern English and Scots, had gained this slightly different meaning. Um, rather than meaning an elf, a little green man that jumps around the forest, it had started to mean, at first, a changeling, so a baby, you know, somebody that was replaced at birth with an elf uh, and therefore grew up being kind of disconnected from other people, a little bit stupid, a little bit away with the fairies. Um, and then, presumably at some point it started to lose the original folkloric meaning and it just came to mean somebody who was a bit stupid or a bit unlike other people, a bit disconnected. And it was able to be loaned into Southern English, loaned into Standard English uh, as basically a separate word meaning something different to elf. So now you have this doublet of elf and as it came to be pronounced in Southern English, oaf, uh, which have two different meanings and oaf defies the normal pattern of sound change from Old English to, to modern standard Southern English. A perhaps more interesting reason for sound changes being incomplete is lexical diffusion. Strictly speaking, lexical diffusion is a model of how sound changes happen in the first place. The idea is that for any given sound change, there's a set of words that meet the criteria for the change and are therefore liable to be affected by it. But instead of following the neo-grammarian principle and snapping all these words into the change at once, instead the change affects some words before others. So at any given point in time, the change will have worked its way through a certain percentage of the eligible words. I'll give you an example that might be familiar to others with an accent similar to mine. In traditional received pronunciation, the posh southern Anglo-English of the 20th century, words like force and core had a separate vowel to words like pure and cure. To pick what was a minimal pair for many speakers, sure as in a seashore, and sure as in I'm sure you're right. So you have or and ur, two different vowels, two different phonemes. In my accent, there is an ongoing merger between these two vowels, but it's not finished yet. 
So in rapid conversational speech, I'd say poor, pure, cure, sure, sure. But if I was speaking carefully, I'd say poor, pure, cure, sure, and sure. So in my brain, two of these ur words still have a separate vowel phoneme, albeit in my accent it's a monophthong, ur. And those are pure and cure. But two of the original ur words poor and sure, have totally merged into the North Force lexical set, poor, sure, North Force, so that no matter how carefully I was talking, I would never, in my own natural accent, say, poor, sure. For me, sure is totally homophonous with sure. This is an example of lexical diffusion in practice. The phonemic status of the ur vowel is clearly kind of collapsing as it merges with or. Well, all I'm saying is if this situation carries on with the sure, sure thing, then within a few generations, English will be incomprehensible. It will be nothing but grunts and hoots. It won't be a, a meaningful system of communication anymore. But the relevance of this lexical diffusion thing becomes more obvious if we look at it uh, in terms of historical examples. I've talked before about the trap bath split, where what was originally an a vowel in very early modern English, say 1600-ish, lengthened and took a lower tongue position if it was followed by a voiceless fricative like f, s, or th, or by a cluster of n, t. So you ended up with one vowel in cat, can, patch, and another in bath, pass, after, and can't. This long vowel gradually receded to a back tongue position, making the difference even more obvious nowadays. Cat, can, patch, bath, pass, after, can't. This split affects basically all Southern Anglo-English dialects, as well as Australian and South African English. This is a straightforward conditioned sound change, but it has exceptions. I would never say aunt to refer to a crawling insect. I always say ant. Likewise, I would never say chaff to refer to the agricultural byproduct. I'd always say chaff. These words seem to have been left behind by the sound change. While the sound change was productive, while it was ongoing, they never got caught up in it. The lexical diffusion never reached them. And so when the sound change ran out of steam and stopped being productive, they were left as remnants of the old days. There's more detail in my video, Why Do Some People Pronounce Off As Off? But phoneticians in the 1600s recorded this process of lexical diffusion fairly clearly in relation to the trap bath split. The new long version of the vowel spread gradually through the words that were eligible for the sound change, rather than taking them all at once. So the question remains, what's the mechanism here? Firstly, why do words fall into conditioned sound changes in the first place? Why doesn't every word just randomly change in its own direction? And secondly, why do sound changes sometimes run out of steam before they're finished? I think I'm going to do another video on at least one of those topics in more detail, but suffice it to say, however conditioned sound changes happen, they probably kind of need to happen that way. It's something of an evolutionarily stable strategy. More on that in maybe the next video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll talk to you again soon. I take it that you pronounce the words meat and meat differently to each other or the words fur and fur differently to each other then if you no. reject all historic sound mergers. Well, you see, that's, this, is, this, is, this is the distinction that needs to be made. That's a matter of historical sound change. We're not talking about historical sound change here. We're talking about the brutal degradation of the English language. Well, but the meat-meat merger was the same type of process. No, 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 no. See, that happened earlier on rather than recently. This is the main thing. This is, this is the main point of distinction that you're not grasping. Those sound changes which have happened recently are bad. Those which happened a relatively long time ago are acceptable. Well, how do you, how do you decide what sound changes <coughs> are acceptable then? I find using myself, my own speech as a model tends to be, um, it tends to provide satisfactory results. So things which I have in my own, sound changes as you call them, which I have in my own speech, perfectly fine. Or if I have them in my own speech, but I haven't noticed them, and it irritates me when, when younger people do them, I find that to be aversive. Um,
but if I if I'm aware of them in my own speech and you're certain I, that's a scientific attitude yes I'm sure you're what sure <laughs>